I want to inter introduce Christian, and if, if Tony um, Del Genio were introducing Christian, I think he would say that um, Christian is one of the few people in the world that maybe I could count on my fingers and toes who actually spend most of their time working on um, cloud parameterization in uh, climate models. And uh, so I love learning from Christian whatever he's learned lately in his talks about science. And um, so now today, I'm really looking forward to hearing about how he gets all this done. Okay. <laughs> Without further ado, thanks for okay. Cool. I forgot to mention he's in Australia at Monash University. All right, this is but meant visiting us for a month. This is meant to be very informal. It's really very, hopefully very indirective. Well, are you raising your finger? No. Anne said visiting us for a month, then Andy corrected for six months, and I said three months. Oh, six months. Oh, sorry. Right. <laughs> no, no, three months. Andy no. didn't take her second. But it's only yeah. it's only three weeks left, so whatever. Uh, had it right. So let's keep this informal. Let's keep it chatty. Um, right. Let's keep it interactive. I've developed this talk for students and <laughs> back in Australia they, they wanted to hear about this because they knew I was I was using particular techniques to organize my work, which we'll come to. And since then I've given it numerous times actually, and I always get much more response to this talk than to any science talk I've ever done, <laughs> which is somewhat disappointing. <laughs> But also somewhat telling that these simple things like to how to organize and how to be effective at work is, is sort of on everybody's head and people struggle with it. Everybody struggles with it, right? Okay, some preliminaries. Um, I'm not a guru in task management. I'd make a lot more money if I was. Um, I charge you probably $5,000 for being here and talking to you for an hour, right? That's what these guys who do this for a living do. However, I've been a practicing scientist and more recently a practicing a academic who has way too much to do and way too little time to do it. So somehow I'm one of you <laughs> who has to cope with this in some way. To help myself, I've been using these sort of different task management techniques and tools for at least 10 years. And it might be even longer. But I got seriously into them when I moved to Australia, which is now almost 13 years ago. And particularly, I'm using a technique, if you guys want to read up on this, you can find it on the internet immediately if you type in GTD, getting things done. This is a, is a set of techniques de developed by a guy called David Allen. And there are books that you can buy, and I'll tell you a little bit about this philosophy. But I'll tell you a little bit more as well, because I'm applying it in the context of doing scientific work, right? which you, you will not get from his books, the tra trans executives of companies. John Betcher's here, you guys seem to talk about this book too. Did you get that from him? Did he get from No, you? he got it from me. Okay. <laughs> um, you cannot learn this in an hour. You cannot learn how to do this in an hour. You have to go away and set it up for yourself. So all I can do is raise awareness of some of the issues you may encounter and give you some tips of how to go about organizing yourself. And like many things in life, this is a skill. Managing your task, believe it or not, it's a skill. It's just like reading, writing, you know, analyzing data. You have to learn it, and it takes time and effort to learn. So do not expect that sort of walking out of this room and the life will be so different and much better than it was before. That's just not going to happen. So if you're interested in this after this talk, you really need to invest some time. However, the principle is extremely simple. The effective work is all about one thing, and that's focus. It's the only thing you need, right? You need to be focused on what you're doing. The trouble is, I mean, so really, at the, the bottom line is that's all there is to it, really. You need to be focused on, when you're doing something, you need to be focused on it. Like, I need to be focused on giving this talk. It would be no point if I was on the phone <laughs> or trying to check my email right now, right? You might laugh about this, but when I give a talk, none of us would think about checking their email when they give a talk, right? I give that as an example all the time. So why do you think you should check your email when you're writing a paper or reading a paper? Or what's different? Why is it different from giving a talk? It shouldn't be. It's just what you should be focusing on, what you've decided to focus on for the next X minutes. So stop treating things differently. I mean, giving a talk is no different from reading a paper, from writing a paper, from doing some data analysis, from running a model. It's all the same. Okay, so that's that's the key. Nothing is special in our life. And so we need to, I, but to be focused on something, you need to, do, you need to know two things. 
and this is what the talk's going to be about is one is you need to know what you should be doing now what's the what's the most important thing to be doing next so you stop you finish something you need to decide what to do next you need to have a method to sort of decide what it is that you're going to do next so you need some way of planning some way of identifying what to do next and then you need to get yourself to doing it because as you will find, especially as you grow up into the hierarchies of science, half the time or more, what you identify as the next thing to do is not something you want to do. So then what? What are you going to do? All right. So we're going to talk about both of those. Both are important, and, and the whole system breaks down if either of them doesn't work. If you, you, know, you can have the greatest plans on earth if you can't get yourself to actually executing them. They are useless. Likewise, you can be great at doing things, but if you don't know what it is you are doing and you randomly pick, then it's of no use. Okay? So one sort of graph which I kind of like because we all know these people, we all know people of this variety, is to, to do planning and execution. This graph is a little bit of an aside, so don't take it too seriously. And I'll come back to the actual stuff in a second. It's from one of David Allen's books. Is, is it's about control and perspective. Perspective is sort of having the big picture, knowing why you're doing what you're doing. And control is actually being able to do something, being in control of your time, of your day, of your work. All right? and, and different times of your life, you will be in different quadrants of this diagram. Ideally, you, we all want to be up here, where we have absolute control over what we're doing, and we're doing it, we know why we're doing it. We have a perspective on things carefully chosen, but you shouldn't feel too bad if you're in here occasionally. You should feel really bad if you're in one of those all the time. So people who have no control and no perspective are either <laughs> victims of the world, or they're simply just responding all the time. And we've all been in this mode, you know, we, 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 we just can't keep up and all we do is respond quickly to, to things that are, we are bombarded with. This happens, don't feel too bad about when it happens. Just feel bad if you're doing this all the time. Then you need to do something about your life. We love these people uh, if they're managing us. They have no idea why <laughs> things are going on, but they have absolute control and they become absolute micromanagers, start managing every aspect. Or they are, you, you, you might be an implementer for some time. You don't know why you're doing what you're doing, but it needs to be done. So, you, know, you know you have to write this code, it needs to be done. Who cares why? Your boss told you to do something. Off you go and you do it. Up here, if you only have perspective, there's no control. So you drive people nuts, potentially. So you have all these ideas. Anybody know someone like this? <laughs> you have all these ideas and you go and you say, hey, I have this idea, could someone do this? And tomorrow they come back and say, I have another idea, actually. <laughs> could someone else do this? So these are people that can drive you crazy. But occasionally you want to be up here, not worry too much how things should be done just what are the next big things and then you know have some vision as to how to drive things so you need to elegantly wander through those quadrants but not be in those for too long and try and be up here as much as you can but life is not simple so you, it's not simple to be up here none of us achieves being up there all the time all right so let's start with the planning how do you then how do you plan stuff so one thing is, so I use this GTD stuff for that, and I'll, I'll give you a bit of a rough overview of what it is and how to start if you wanted to implement it in your work. A key issue for our work before we get into details is of course the task of what we do is not defined. So if you're a bus driver, if you're a subway driver, your task is defined, drive subway, arrive at six, six in the morning, get on the subway drive, go home at three in the afternoon, that's it. In our job, that's not how it works. So one of the difficulties we all have is that defining the task itself is part of our job, right? So we need to spend time thinking about what we should be doing, what our tasks actually are. So that makes our life interesting, but also more complicated. Because if you're a bus driver, you don't need to worry about much. You come in in the morning, drive the bus, you go home in the evening. There's lots of things that happen along the way, but really, it's easy. Another sort of preamble to the planning is, um, I actually think this is more important than we, than we think. So this is a quote from David Allen, essentially. So most people think we, we have these courses on time management. 
We don't, you don't manage time. Forget it. Time runs, it will happen, you don't manage it. It manages you, perhaps, <laughs> but you don't manage time. Time is not something you can manage, okay? Keep that in mind so people think, oh, I need to manage my time. No, you don't, you can't. The other thing that people often say is they manage their priorities, and that's not true either. You have priorities, right? You can, it's not, nothing you can really manage. There's either your own personal priorities or priorities given to you through the environment you're in. There's very little you can manage. What you can manage is what you do at any given point in time. Okay? That you can manage. So it's really task management. That's why I call it task management that you have to apply. For that, you need to sort of figure out what your tasks are. And then you need to structure them in a way that they're accessible to you, that you know what your next tasks are and how you how you start. Anybody do the every morning list, so we'll come to how to plan. But a lot of planning that people do is they come in in the morning, they write their list for the day. Who does it? I used to do that. I did this morning. Yeah. How often do you get through the list? Ah, uh, just roll over the list. Ah, yeah, there you go. Yes. The answer is never. It's not intimidating. <laughs> it's so answer is never. I know we're going to get to this, but because the tasks are too big. And then okay. people have long lists, and then... But why don't you get through the list normally? Because each item on the list is too much to get through. And so you're a lousy planner, basically. You're putting way too much on that list. Right, that really that's why I'm here. Well, the list is not necessarily meant for a day. Yeah. You can make a list for... How you know? Long 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 well, you always we all have our long-term lists of sorts of things that we ought to do. <laughs> What's on your list? What would would be a? They're actually list? projects, so it would be more like a priority list. Okay, we'll we'll, we'll come to projects and, and actual tasks on the next slide, and then that's one of the key things. So one of the key things, the other reason we never get through these lists, I think, is because during the day stuff happens. So I make my list, and then I get an email. Um, and the email says, I urgently need to write two pages on this, and I need it tonight. Okay, so what are you going to do? Yeah, you make your list, and then Christian walks into your office. Yeah, and, and wants to talk <laughs> about something. <laughs> <laughs> and he has to write the two pages. <laughs> so, so there's this constant flow of information and new things coming in that you somehow need to manage. And often you don't get to the end of the list because something happened during the day that you didn't anticipate, but that took priority over other things. So you made a choice, a personal choice, that this was more important than that, or Christian came into your office and you didn't dare kicking him out. But that's still a personal choice. Could have kicked me out. Says, Christian, not today. I need to write the two pages. <laughs> All right, so. Christian, hmm? so I, th I think another difference from our work from, from other people is that that um, if we our priorities are yeah long term priorities. We don't have that many deadlines. Like a paper does not need to be finished that's right. next next week or so. And that's with right. with with companies that's probably different. Yeah so we'll come back to deadlines and how to deal with deadlines and what to put deadlines on and what not to put deadlines on because it's actually quite important to the system. So what I what, what we try and what, what this is trying to do is trying to keep you flexible so that you choose what to do next in a sort of well informed and very flexible way. Okay. So David Allen in his book points out that successful people usually have at least 150% of their time committed. <laughs> to already committed to tasks yeah. before yeah. the email comes in the morning and you know, someone needs two pages. Already 150%. So that raises two immediate questions. And how can you go to sleep? Right? How could you possibly sleep having to remember all those tasks? And the second one is how do you decide what not to do? Because there's one third of what's on your plate will not get done. So how do you, how do you choose? And the, the system that he's developed is essentially about helping you with those two. The first thing is um, so on the planning, the basic these are some basic principles, and then we'll go through the steps how to do it. Easy, how, yeah, how I do it anyway. And part of this overlaps with what he suggests, and part of it doesn't. First thing is get everything out of your head. It's a very important one. That's the how can you sleep at night? You have to have a system that contains everything you need to do. This can be written on a piece of paper in a calendar, whatever, or it could be on your computer. My, in modern days, most of the time, most of us have it on their computer, right? They have it on my computer. But everything of 
all the information of what you need to do needs to be in there. Everything. You know, you, he says everything in terms of personal and <coughs> uh, professional life. I only do my professional life. I refuse to go to that level of organization in my personal life. I want to have a little bit of sort of randomness happening in my life, right? At work, randomness is a bad idea, but it, at home it can be a very good idea. Um, then you break down everything you do into projects and action, and this is actually very important. Um, so on lots of people's lists, there are projects, not things you can do, but huge projects, like write paper on, you know, that's my list. Well, that's no good, because it'll take you months to achieve. It's not obvious what, just from that sentence, not obvious what to do next, right? To achieve that, ultimately. So write paper on is actually a project. You can think of anything that takes more than one step as a project. Go to dinner with friends is a project. It takes more, more than one step. I, I'm not suggesting you use this in a <laughs> fancy system, I don't, but, but it's a project because first you need to figure out when you could go, when they could go. Well, first you need to define the purpose of the dinner, right? First you need to make friends. <laughs> Let's read the friends out. Going for dinner. <laughs> Going for dinner is a project because first you need to figure out what the dinner is for. If it's meant to be a romantic dinner, I suggest you and your partner go. If it's meant to be catching up with old friends, you better make sure you invite the old friends, right? So it, it really, the purpose of the thing defines a lot of things. Then you need to find out days when you can make it, when your friends can make it, what food they like, what food they don't like. Then you need to call the restaurant, make the reservation, and then you need to go. There's lots of steps, so it's certainly not something you, going for dinner is not just one thing. So for every project that you then have in your life, the, the way forward, actually, which works really, really well, is to identify for each of your projects what is the next action that you need to take. And an action is something you can actually do. Can be as little as download data from NCAR, because you need it to make the figure. So even making a figure is probably a, a sub-project of your project, because you need to download the data, you need to write the code, you know, whatever. So, so break everything down into steps that you can actually do, little granules, and then identify the one that you need, you, you need to, want to, can do next. And the beauty of this is now you don't need to worry about anything else on this project, because if you're good at identifying what the next step is, you only need to worry about that next step. Once you've done it, you worry about what the next step is. So that reduces writing paper to downloading data, which is a much simpler task. Right? So when you look at what have, what, what's on my plate, it's not write paper, it's not write pro proposal, it's not this, it's download data, make plot, write code, whatever. Practical, very practical things that you're not scared of. Whereas, <laughs> I, you know, write paper, you're scared of. It's a big thing. God, write a paper, gee, that will take forever. But downloading the data will might only take you 10 minutes, but it's a, you know. The other beauty of this is um, psychologically, this is this will make you feel very happy because you will get lots done in a day. Whereas if your if your tasks are things like write paper, write proposal, and so on and so forth, very very rarely will you go home feeling happy because <laughs> you will not have ticked off many of those. They'll still be there tomorrow and the day after and the day after. The other important thing: only assign deadline to things that really have deadlines. Right? There's lots of things that don't have deadlines. You mentioned it. writing a paper. Usually, you don't put a deadline. We might have our internal deadline. And treat everything as as soon as I can. So every of your actions that don't have a real deadline to them is as, as soon as I can. I'll do it as soon as I can. Right? That's my, my goal is to do all these things as soon as I can. All right. So all you need to worry then is the next action of each of your project. And so you, the choice of what you do is now entirely defined, and it's this is not quite that simple, but in principle entirely defined by your next action list. So in the software that I use and most software pieces, and I give you some um, suggestions at the end what you could try, they make, they make it very simple to list all your next actions. What are all your next actions? Because you only need to look at them unless you are a bad planner. 
and you haven't done it very carefully, but if you're doing this carefully, all you need to look at is what are my next actions. And then at that point, and there's probably only you know as many next actions as you have projects, so maybe 30, 40, they're quick, you can scan them very quickly, you can pick the one that at that point in time you think is the most important one to do. Okay, we'll come, it's a little bit more complicated than that, so we'll come to that. So the way it works is this, it looks complicated, but I'll go through this. This is sort of the workflow of this system of planning. This looks as this will take you years to practice and hours to just decide on everything, but it, it's not true. It takes seconds for every new piece of information that comes in. It takes a few seconds to deal with it, I promise. So the first, so there's five steps in this. First step is to collect the information. Then there's a processing step where you need to sort of decide something about the information. Then you need to organize it. Occasionally you need to review what you're doing um, because otherwise you lose track of all the different things that are going on. And then you need to do stuff. The collection step sounds trivial, but it's not trivial at all. Treat, the trick is when new information comes in to, to, to quickly just store it in your trusted system and then get on with things. So for instance, I could be sitting in my office George might walk in and say, can you, send me, can you send me this paper, right? I now mustn't forget to send George the paper, but I'm in the middle of something. I will say, yes, I'll send it to you this afternoon. There's a usually shortcut buttons on your computer. I press a shortcut button. Let's see whether it works. No, it doesn't work when I'm in. <laughs> oh, yeah, it actually does. You just can't see it. But my little tool brought up. No, you can't see it. Okay. Let's, let's go out of the presentation mode. not cooperating. Anyway, there's usually a little it. short. Can see it. There it is. Okay, now I have to get my mouse there. So I just type send George paper, whatever, and it's gone. It's stored. So this is seconds, right? We're talking seconds. And I, I now can't forget it because it's in the system. But where it is, is just like in your email, most systems have an inbox. And it's just in an inbox. It's not organized, it's not attached to projects, it's not attached to anything, but it's there. Again, I'll forget about it and it can carry on, whatever it is I was doing. So that's a really nice way of working, right? Because information does come in. Um, unexpectedly, you get a phone call or whatever. It's not, n nothing you can do about it. But it's in the in-basket, and that's all you do. The first step is all this, and you do that until you have time to think about processing and organizing your work. The next step is to, you go occasionally, and I do it probably <coughs> three times a day, sometimes more often, but three times a day, you look at your in-basket. And the only thing you need to decide is, is this something I need to do something about? Is, is this actionable? If there is, then I have to decide what's the next action. And then a very important step is, because there's an overhead in processing all this stuff into a system, if you can do it in two or three minutes, do it straight away. Don't. Don't put it into some complicated planning system. You just do it straight away. If you get an email, so you go, one of the classic examples, you go through your emails in the morning or whatever. You look at the first email, you say, do I need to do something about it? Oh yeah, I need to let them know that if that's okay, well that will take me less than two minutes, so you reply and say it's okay. <laughs> the other possibility is it's, it's, it's rubbish, so it can go into the bin straight away. And the third option is it will take me more than five minutes, say, to res respond to this, in which case I want to just commit it to my project system and I will write down, respond to email from Anne, but I know it's, it's you know, will take me more than five minutes because it's kind of a complicated email and I'll just store it away for now, okay? And then you organize all this information into projects. There's a lovely thing that this guy always <laughs> describes, but I find it very, uh, well, it never, it never did anything for me. If you have an idea and you kind of just want to make sure you don't forget about it, but you're not, you don't really think it's going to lead to anything, you, you make yourself a, a folder called Someday Maybe. But what you will find, most of you, the Someday Maybe folder will look lovely. <laughs> You'll never do it. That's what I find. If the, so the other possibility is you might, you might be able to delegate this thing that needs doing. It might not be you who has to do it. it. Could be your friend, your student, your wife, your partner, whoever. 
in which case you, you, you delegate it, but you make a note in your system that you're waiting for them to provide you with some information. You know, your friends, you wrote an email to your friends and said, do you want to go for dinner Monday? Now you're waiting for the response. So you make a little note, just say, wait for response from Paul on dinner. And you just keep it as a waiting, in a waiting basket. You're waiting for things. That way you don't lose track of something that you're waiting for. That actually turns out, could turn out to be very important. If you defer things, if it's something has to be done at a specific time, put it in a calendar. But if it doesn't have to be done in a specific time, you put it down as just as an next action on a project or as an action on a project. So then the organization is really about identifying projects. And you can do that top down. You can make the project first and then decide what the actions should be. Or it happens bottom up because you need to do something. Suddenly a new project emerges. You think, oh my god. This will take more than one step. It becomes a, a new project. So you establish projects, and in those projects, you have actions. I might show you what this looks like in my current world um, in a second. Project planning is not as simple as you think. <coughs> but project planning, we do it naturally, but then we forget how we do it. And then when we plan projects with colleagues, we do it badly, usually. Who's been in this meeting? You know, you go in this meeting and say, "Oh, we want to do, we want to do a field experiment." Who's got a good idea? Okay, and then people start talking. Three hours later, you have <laughs> lots of ideas. You have no idea where this is going. Right? That's a waste of time in some sense. And it's because normally what we do in life, kind of naturally, is to say, "Why are we doing this?" Go back to the dinner. Right? I want to go to dinner. Why am I? Why am I going to dinner? What's the point? Meet friends have nice food, have a romantic evening, whatever. So the first thing you do naturally is to define the purpose and the principles under which you are prepared to operate. An example for that is um, how much money do I want to spend on the dinner? And that's a sort of boundary condition, right? Which sets rules that are quite important. So if I am not prepared to spend more than 30 bucks, well, then I can't go to the place I went last night with George and Phil. <coughs> You know, so how much did you say? <laughs> <laughs> now you need to, you know, not so much for the dinner, but if you if you're planning a project for work, think about what would be a good outcome. What would you be happy with if you if you, you know? So this this might set timelines, for instance. You might say, oh, I want to write a paper on this, and a good outcome would be if I had finished it by the end of July. So you might want to set yourself at least a tentative. I would I would appreciate for myself if I could do this by the end of this July. Or it could be, you know, what would I be happy with? Then you start asking, who has a good idea? And well, you, you need to define the purpose first, because otherwise, what's a good idea or not a good idea is hard to identify. We have lots of good ideas, but they might not fit the purpose. Once you've done that, you organize stuff, and then you identify what's next. There's one cool thing that the getting things done system lets you do and all the software that I've know that I, I've seen implements that. And that is each task that you identify, this is now at the level of the little tasks, you can put at least one, sometimes more contexts for this task. Now why would you want to do this and what, what does it mean? So in my practical application I have sort of four contexts. One could be the location. So you need for certain things you need to be in your office to be able to do them certain things you need to be at home to do them. It might be an errand that you have to run. The other one that I like really very much is another context is the duration. You can make an estimate how long it might take you to do this, right? So if, it, if you need to read a paper, that's probably an hour. If you need to respond to an email, that might be only 10 minutes. And so you, you attach that to the task as you put it in, as you organize your task. And so later on, you can then say, I use this a lot. I have half an hour before I want to go home. Would be nice to get a few. I, I'm done with the big things. Would be nice to get a few little things knocked over. So I list all the things that I put 10 minutes against, and I do three. Makes me feel good. Stuff gets done. I go home happy. You know, I've done, <laughs> I've done three more things. Great. Knocked off three things off my long list of things to do. Fantastic. So that's helpful. Likewise, I have three hours this morning. I have no meetings, no interruptions, I'm working from home, I'm listing my stuff. Let's not waste it with all this little stuff. Let's spend it on stuff that we said would take us a long time because these three hour periods are kind of rare. 
So I list all the things that I need to do that have long times attached to them, and then I work on one of those, rather than on all these little things. People can be contacts. Who's George? Uh, don't know. Yeah, finished. Finish the process. So people can be contacts if you need to talk, talk to someone about something, you can put them as a context. The beauty of that is if you know you're meeting George, to pick on him at 11, then you can just list all the things you have George against to make sure that you don't forget something you wanted to talk about. And then the type of the task, read, write, discuss, think, email is the type of a task. And then you can, so for instance, you can then sort things. So for instance, when you work on email, and we'll come to email because it's the bane of everybody's existence. Uh, that's before Facebook and Twitter. But Facebook and Twitter are no different. But email is still the one we all struggle with. So I have a specific one on email. I work on email. Email is, becomes a, 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 a something I work on for an hour. And when I do it, I can list all the things that I said would be to do with email, right? What I needed to do regarding email. And so on and so forth. Okay, before we get to the practical implementation and, and actually doing stuff, one important thing is you need to review the system now. Imagine you the system; it will have about fifty projects and three hundred tasks, you know, listed in your thing. You will not be able to manage this unless you review it on a regular basis. And how often should you review something depends on what level. The, the thing is. So the next actions, for instance, you review, I, I look at those more than once a day. In principle, every time I'm done with something, I'm looking at my next action list. So I'm, in a sense, reviewing them, right? Because I'm seeing them, new ones might have popped up. Um, so that's a very frequent one. About once a week, you should look at all your projects and see whether, you know, whether you have missed something on a project, you haven't identified the next action, or the next action against this project is actually not what you now think should be the next thing you should be doing because you changed your mind, some new information came in, someone's already done something, who knows. So once a week you want to look at all your projects. And it's not that arduous a task, it takes me about 20 minutes. So it's not that it's, you know, I'm spending hours just implementing the system. We all have areas of responsibility, so mine are teaching, graduate students, admin, research, and you want to review whether the balance is still right every few months. Right? Because you might be pushed in a certain direction that you don't like. You might want to do more research, but you can't do it because you have to do so much teaching. Well, you can do that for three months, but you don't want to do it for years because then you lose your job satisfaction, you might want to quit. So you should all have one to two year goals. Most people don't, but it's kind of hard to do all this right if you don't know where you're going. It's easy for students because the goal is right to freaking thesis. That's the, that's the only goal, <laughs> and that's the long-term goal. Once you get beyond that, it gets a bit harder. What the longer-term goal is, what do you want to be? Do you want to be a researcher? Do you want to be an academic? So where, where you want to have? You want to have a sort of a five-year goal. I'd really like to be somewhere. But those we review every so often. And then there's life. What do you, you know, what's, is 42 the answer or not? <laughs> and you review that all the time anyway, so there's no System, but so so depending on the level of, of where this uh, where things sit in your life, you want to review them frequently or less frequently. What do you do? You have any comments on project definition? Because for instance, we work in field campaign data, right? And we are often involved with a number of projects related to that field campaign. Yeah. And then if there'll be, you know, so would you cat? Is there sub projects, or do you, you know, yes. how does that work for you? There can be sub projects. I never define projects as uh, so the field campaign, say TWPIs, that isn't a project. Uh -huh. That's an area of responsibility. So would a project? Because I, I have you lots of things. Example. Yeah. Um, you, I guess maybe it's too similar to that, but you have a certain funded grant, say. Yeah. You know that has certain goals, and then there might be you know two papers this year on that grant. If yeah. I were lucky, but so is that? Um, so each paper would be a project. But the not grant, grant wouldn't be a project. I see. Okay, no. so it's kind of granular. That's what I do. I'm, yeah, I'm just okay. telling you what I do, right? So I, I would make each paper a project or a data analysis thing that I would okay. do under this grant would be a project or a model study that I want to do under this project would be under this I grant see. would Before be a project. It so it's data. much more granular than just grant on yeah, okay. X. Okay. Um, 
I started off with ground on X, but it's not granular enough. This, especially if it comes to next actions and you want to limit yourself to just look at the next action, sometimes it's not serial, right? It can do things in parallel. So that's usually a, a time when you realize, oh, there are five things I could do in parallel here. Then it's time to granularize the project further, probably. Because each of those five things might be uh, another, the start of another project. So when it's not serial anymore, then you might want to think about splitting it up. But you need to be flexible and you need to see what works for you. I mean, the key is not to forget things, <laughs> right? That's one thing. And the other key is to have a really good way of deciding what you want to do, because that defines what you're not going to do in a much more sort of rather, I forgot. There's one downside to this whole. <laughs> People know you're doing this, you cannot use the I forgot excuse anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it involves a certain honesty in your life, which I have implemented. It turns out to be quite refreshing to write to an editor of a journal that, no, you, you haven't forgotten the review. It just hasn't risen up your priority list enough <laughs> yet. But you're going to do it next week because now it's really high on your priority. Um, so forgetting is hard with this if you implement it properly. Okay, so then finally there's the step where you need to do stuff. Now that's e that sounds easier than it is. So we've planned our actions with this getting things done system. We are experts in it. It works wonderfully. And it turns out the next action is something I don't want to do. Okay, for me, I, I often use this as an example. And, so, and then we procrastinate, right? And the procrastination is not very good for efficiency, actually. It's the worst thing you can do. And so for me, often I have, these days, I have to write references for students and postdocs who've applied for other jobs. And I hate it with a passion. I hate writing about other people and what I think about them. I hate it. Um, so I, but I still need to do it because I know it's important. It's probably one of the most important things I do these days because these guys will then get jobs or not, depending on but I pay attention to this or not, right? And if I don't write them a reference, people might think I don't like them, and therefore they won't be hired. And so it's, it's a really important thing to do, but it's really one I don't like to do. So how do you get yourself to do this? So this is now not David Allen. I use a technique called Pomodoro. Pomodoro is just Italian for tomato. Tomato, I should say, not tomato. And it's called this because there was an egg timer in Italy that looked like a tomato. That's, that's the secret of the name. But the technique is actually quite cool. Because it's such a common problem to, to not get going on something. The, the first idea is you break your work down into 25 minute blocks. Make, you can make it 20, you can make it 30, but don't make it an hour. That's too long. And don't make it 10 minutes. That's too short. So something around the 25 minute mark. Write down what you're going to do. Make a contract with yourself. And writing it down amazingly, instead of just thinking about it, seems to make a difference, at least for me, psychologically. You write it down. I'm now, the next 25 minutes, I'm going to work on this reference for X. Mm -hmm. Then you work on it without distractions. Zero distractions. No email, no anything, no Facebook, no Twitter, no mobile phone, <laughs> nothing. Just work on it. 25 minutes. And the 25 minutes kind of cute in this context because we can all convince ourselves that for 25 minutes, surely we can live without Facebook and without uh, this. It's only 25 minutes. Come on. We can all do this. If your phone rings or someone comes in the door. That's a great thing about email and Facebook and Twitter. The phone rarely wings. Exactly. <laughs> well, if your phone rings, you need to make a decision how important this is to you. You could have a phone message that says, mm -hmm. you know, we have a do not disturb button, which I can press on my phone, and then it goes straight to voicemail. Mm -hmm. And that's what I do. And then I call them back. <laughs> you know. And it's only 25 minutes, so the longest they might have to wait for me to call back is 25 minutes. Come on. That's fine. Then the 25 minutes are over, and in principle, you take a five minute break, and then you take and do the next 25 minutes. So you do the same thing again, you decide. And it goes really well with this getting things done idea. The two work well together because you can look up what should I be doing next. If you're done, if you're not done, you continue doing what you're doing. 
I'm just actually I interrupted or you know I, Andy's got a good point about people coming to your door just like you went to George's door. <laughs> and so, um, so I'll tell you what yeah, I do yeah, in a second. I have a I have a I have a slide on this. Uh, it's actually the next one, the next slide. Um, and there's software you can do this. Uh, the idea is then you do four of those, so about two hours worth of work, and then you take a longer break. You go and have lunch, or you go and go for a walk just to refresh. There's some really good side effects. If you're like me and you have back and neck problems and they give you headaches, this stuff even helps with that. Because I, in the, I make an effort to get up after 25 minutes, walk around, make a coffee, you know, not sit at my desk and do more computer stuff, but get up there. So that you can build all this stuff in there. It's actually quite nice. It's a, quite a nice way of, of working. And in your five minutes, and if the five minutes become 10 minutes, well, so be it. You can either answer the phone call or go to your Facebook page or check your Twitter account or whatever it is you want to do. Because you're taking a break from what you were doing. The other thing, the reason they suggest about this length of time is the sort of the attention span we have is, is no longer than this. We, we, we tend to get distracted from whatever we are doing uh, in about that time, just from a neuroscience. Neuroscientists have an idea why. I'm not, I'm not really understand why, but they know that this happens. Okay, for, for this to work, this is perhaps on Andy's question, you have to have a block of time in your day where you can work, you know, say for an hour or two at least, without expecting to be distracted. So you need to organize your day for that to happen. All right, and I do this. So you need to plan your day so that you have periods of time in which you can work undisturbed. And then you, you plan other parts of your day where you're expecting to talk to George in his office. Or, you know. My trick is, I learned this from a friend, is that the mornings are mine and the afternoons belong to others. So uh, the, I usually have, I usually not here, George will attest to this, but at home I start working about 8. From 8 to 11, that's my time. No one gets into the way of the, into my into my way for that period of time. And then after that, I'm not even trying to do any of these longer term things like write papers and do data analysis. I'm not even trying. I know I've done my three hours of that, and now I have five or six or seven hours to talk to my students, talk to my colleagues, have meetings, and so on and so forth. Of course, this doesn't work perfectly every day. Sometimes there are meetings that you didn't call, and then you have to turn up at 10 to go to a meeting. Sure, but this is the sort of aspiration, and you try, and, and you, you, need to, you need to sort of generate some level of control. So for instance, when we come to email, will be my last slide. Um, <coughs> All the people I work with are trained to know that to send, sending me an email, can I meet you in half an hour, is completely pointless. <laughs> because the chances are that I will not have seen this email until three hours later. right? Because they know how I work. So you need to let your friends and colleagues and people around you know that this is how you work and why. And they will, surprisingly, it works. Everybody understands because everybody has the same problem. So if you tell people, you know, I've implemented the system, and between 8 and 11, I try not to have meetings. I tell my PA not to book any meetings in the morning, not before 11 o'clock, and it works. And people know, and after a while, everybody knows, oh yeah, Christian, I don't need to send him an email. I want to meet him in 10 minutes. If it's so urgent that I need to meet him in 10 minutes, I need to go up and knock on his door. And he'll be grumpy, but it's urgent. <laughs> <laughs> right? And if it's not urgent, they will know, well, but he's around from about 11. He has this sort of open slather kind of working style, so I can catch him there. It's fine. That works really well. Okay, finally, email. Do not watch your email all the time. We all do it. I do it. Everybody does. I slip back into this habit. I do it all the time. You know, if I don't pay attention to not doing it, it I'll slip back into this habit. My email will be on. Some new email comes. I stop whatever I'm doing. George is doing it just now. <laughs> <laughs> so you, sh you have techniques now. If you implement the GTD and the Pomodoro thing in, in principle, and none of this you can do religiously because life isn't that cannot be organized that strictly. So don't take it too seriously. And don't beat yourself up if there was a day where it didn't work out. But instead, defi I define two 
or four, depending on how much email I sort of know I still have to do of these intervals to process my email using the getting things done method, right? So the first step is the, all the new email that came in overnight, you process. The same way, can I do it? Is it rubbish? Then I delete it. Can I do it in two minutes? Then I'll reply straight away. Does it need more than two minutes? Then I file it away for now. And I make a note in my system that I still need to reply to it. Okay. And then in the afternoon, I take another 30 minutes or hour, or hour and a half often, where I then process it, where I actually do the long replies. And actually it, it, so email becomes no different from writing papers, reading papers, working on data, working with, having meetings. And it shouldn't be. It's, it's no different. It's just it, because of its immediacy, we all make it, uh, give it a way too high priority. It has a much higher priority in our lives than it should have. It should have the same priority as other things. That's, that's the key of the GTD thing. Everything has the same priority, right? And then you choose well, not the same priority, but everything is the same, and then you choose what has the highest priority right now. And then in an hour, that might be something completely different because the priorities have changed. And so that's what I do with my email. And when I'm working on something in this Commodore thing, did you know that on the Mac, it's actually Apple Q? You can quit your email program. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> You can quit it. It doesn't need to be open even. You, know, you can quit it properly. You don't get notifications. Nothing. It's not hard to press the quit button. So I press the freaking quit button <laughs> for the three hours that I want to work and not be disturbed by email. Do it. It's easy. It really is. It's refreshing. I do email free weekends. You know how wonderful that is? Yeah. An email free weekend. Deliberately. You know, not by because I'm not there, I can't read it. No, I decide this weekend, you know what? This weekend, I'm not going to read it. You should, the, the thing is to wrestle control back from the, the system to yourself. You need to be in control, otherwise you won't be efficient. You can't be efficient if you're not in control. We have that. You will become one of those victims and responders, you know, who just respond all the time to emails and so on and so forth. Okay, final slide is just some, some software tips. So there's different levels of implementing the system, and there's software, and I'm a Mac person, so the software I'm listing here, except for this one, I think. This one, of course, multi-system even exists on Linux, I think. So there's uh, some easy ones, um, called one called Things, one is called Firetask, and one is called To Do. They're all sort of in, at the same level, and they're all okay. Intermediate, I, I use something called OmniFocus. I might have time to show you a little bit in a minute what it does. Uh, there's one called Organized Pro, and there's this Pagico, which exists across systems. It's the only one I know that exists across systems. I'm 100% convinced there's at least a gazillion for Windows as well. It's just that I don't look at that market. And there's a very advanced one, um, the brain. What it means with advanced is that you really need to set up the system, the GTD stuff yourself. It's not built into the software. These all have the, these two levels have it all built in. Here it's very easy to use. Here it's a little bit more uh, complicated, but it offers you more freedom once you figure out how it works. Um, almost all of them. Don't go to the app store and buy them. Almost all of them have websites that allow you to download it for 30 days to play around with it. But you can't do that if you go to the App Store. So you need to actually go to their website and download it from their website. Almost all of them give you a 30-day trial. This is one of the nasty things the App Store seems to have been introduced, that people think they can't try anymore, but you have to buy for 40 bucks or 30 bucks. Yeah, it's not true. You, you can go to developers' and websites and get the stuff for free for 30 days. Okay? What about the Pomodoro software? Is that separate? Do you use that too? Yeah, I I use this one because I bought it. It's it's way too expensive for what it does. <laughs> I think it costs twenty five bucks or something like that. And really, all it does is you you put your thing in. But but because I had bought it foolishly, I now use it. Of course, one of the nice things about this one compared to the free stuff is the reminders work better. So on this one, you can set up when the thing tells you how many minutes you have left, which is really helpful. Because if you're writing a, a, a bit of a paper or something like that, 
and it says you've got five minutes left, you can plan a little bit ahead, and then it says you've got one minute left, and so you wrap it up. Um, you can always extend it. I think for starters, you know, bring your kitchen timer, it's fine. Can you mention what is in vitamin R that's not in OmniFocus? Oh, they're completely different. They are completely Why different. don't they just have a little timer with it? Shouldn't they just have a... Yeah, you I can see. download a little timer. That's why I'm saying, bring your kitchen see. timer to begin with. But there's no built-in one on you. So the vitamin R, the difference is you can, you type in what you're going to do, it keeps a log, and afterwards you, you tell it how focused you were and it keeps a log of your answers. But it's un totally unconnected. From yeah, they have nothing to do with each other. Yeah. Absolutely nothing to mm -hmm. do. And you use them both faithfully. Reason. I use this when I have in my three hour blocks. I don't use it for the rest of the day. Yeah. Yeah. Right? When I have these long blocks of time where I want to do something, then I use it because I want to remind myself and also want to take breaks and make tea and get up and stretch my back and all that sort of stuff. Then I use it. I don't use it. This one I use all the time. But effectively, it's just here's what I'm doing for the next 25 minutes. Yeah. And Here's the twenty-five minutes. And I'm, ma I'm making a, I'm making a contract with Give myself. A piece, of, piece of paper at a time. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And if you're good enough to stick to your own contract without writing it down, well, you don't even need to do that. Just set the time and go. Fine. I mean, the the one thing is don't don't overthink it. it. This is meant to help you. If it becomes a burden, then it's useless, right? So it's meant to free you up and, and <laughs> liberate you, not introduce yet another chore that you have to do every day. And so everybody is different. I, some people have tried this and so thought it was absolutely ludicrous. Some people have tried it, use it absolutely religiously. I'm somewhere in the middle, I would say. So because if you read the book, you, it will tell you if you don't have your personal life in there, you will fail. That's just not true you know, for me. And, and you, you need to give yourself bigger room in it as well, but not too much, because then you then it becomes pointless, then you might as well abandon it. Right? So I don't know, I can show you the software if you want to see it, but we're also out of time. Kind of. Maybe the people who want to see some, some examples can hang around. Any other questions? Any? I mean, this is really meant to help. Are you planning to end five minutes <laughs> hmm? before two? Were you planning to end five minutes before two? No. <laughs> but I have the two minute per slide rule. Oh. Was it going? Do you have a buzzer? No, I just know that if I have 45 minutes, I can have 22 slides. <laughs> Roughly. And it works almost all the time. Mm -hmm. These are only 18 slides because there's always a bit more to chat. In. But that's the way to do the talks, but that's nothing to do with getting things done. Yeah? Have you ever tried using other calendar programs? Like well, so the calendars don't easily ma don't make it easy to have projects. At least not as many as you need, because you'll end up with 30, 40 projects. Really, calendars have these colors, and you could argue, oh, each color could be a project, and I make the to-do list in each color. But it's clunky. It's much clunkier than it needs to be. The other thing they don't have is an easy way to identify what the next action is. So one of the advantages of, of, of this OmniFocus software, for instance, if you already know 10 steps that you have to have in this project, you can put them all in at, that, at, at the start, right? You can put all your 10 steps that you're thinking of that you need. Then you look through them and you identify which one is the next, the first one. You put it on top of the list, and then you can display only top of the list of all your projects for instance. And there's a lot of flexibility. The contexts are not there in calendars usually. You know, so being you know putting email ten minutes, five minutes, twenty minutes, uh, people and so on. So there's a lot more flexibility in, in the way you can display the information. It's about displaying information. In in most of the software you can have deadlines and I put myself some deadlines because there are deadlines sometimes for writing something, you know Getting, getting a form in for something. So there's often is deadlines. People say, we need your review by. And it's just, I treat them as soft deadlines if it's not in the calendar. But I treat them as deadlines. Mm. What, I mean, from your experience, what was your learning curve? I mean, meaning, you know, I mean, I, mean, I have several questions, in fact. I mean, 
did this change your behavior kind of and how much did it take for you to because I guess it's not only a method that changes you your way of, of doing things and in the beginning it's hard because you're used to yeah to more a, a chaos kind of yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, kind yeah, of yeah, yeah, paradigm yeah. and uh, I guess it's not easy to switch like uh, from one day to another as you said so, so how much did it take you the, the recommendation that this guy makes in his book, and I, I did that, is to spend a day, to, to find a day, which is your start day, and spend a day really collecting all the information, putting it all into the software, and making it, and from that day on, start using the software. But you need to, it will take you a while to collect all the information that you already know, because you have to start somehow. So his recommendation is to start by first collecting everything that you already have and then start using the system, rather than say, okay, from today on, anything new that comes I'll put in, and anything old I'll still treat with the old system. So that's the first thing. So it, a, an abrupt start is probably a good idea, if you can. The learning curve is not that steep. I mean, it's about the fiddliness of the software. None of it's perfect. There's always things you will hate about each one of them because they can't do it the way you want to do it, but we know that. That's true for, for almost everything, every software we use. Um, after that, it's, it's relatively straightforward. The, the thing that happens to me on a regular basis, particularly when I travel, is I slip out of it. Right? So I don't use it as much as I should. Mm -hmm. Especially when you're traveling and you're on a conference because you're not doing much anyway during the conference But lots of information comes in what you should be doing next week And that that's a dangerous sort of moment <laughs> Every time I go to a conference, so then I usually I, I cover that by coming back From the conference and spending an hour or two to mm -hmm. sort of Put it all in again and make sure um, It really depends I would say what the learning curve is uh, and 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 I think, but I think you will find out pretty quickly whether this is something you want to do or you don't want to do. Mm -hmm. So from experience, telling my friends about this and them coming back to me, it takes a month for you to figure out whether this is something that suits you or is something that doesn't suit you. Because I know extremely successful people who would not go anywhere with this, mm -hmm. right? So don't think that you mu anybody yeah. must do this and it will. It really is something you to try and see whether you like it and whether it actually helps you and if it does, great, and if it doesn't, just abandon it and go back to what you did before, it's fine. Is, is some of this software also, like it stores it in the cloud and you can yeah. access it? Yeah, so if, you are, if you're a gadget person like myself, um, then all the software <laughs> exists for iPads and iPhones and uh, and your uh, so you really desktop. So you have an account and it's... And you have an account and it's usually included and you buy it. Um, some you have to pay extra, it depends on this OmniFocus, so it's you can make an account with on their server and then you have it synced between all your different devices because you might want to have type it in on your iPhone because you just think you're sitting in a subway, you're thinking of something yeah. and you might want to type it in. Yeah, I'm not, because I'm only using it for work, um, that rarely happens to me. So I have all the iPhone and iPad versions and all that sort of stuff, waste a lot of money on this stuff. But I very, very rarely use them because most of the time for work, I have my laptop. I'm a, a laptop only person. I don't have a desktop. So you only think about work when you're working? Um, <laughs> no, but I very rarely uh, have to come up with great new ideas on the subway these days. I'd rather read it. I'm with Christian on the email free weekend too. You can do it and nothing <laughs> happens. <laughs> yeah, that's I, right. I, I, the world I mean, continues on. Uh, an know? important thing about that for me though is that you do want to separate your personal and your work email. If you do that, I mean, yeah. you know. I even got to the point where I, where I had my personal email on a different computer that didn't have my work email on. You can do these things. If you have a computer at home, <laughs> it doesn't have to have your work account on. You know, you can delete things on your client. There's no need. <coughs> and that way you only have your personal email account on it. And you only do personal stuff. I, again, I think there's no one-fits-all rule on the sort of work-life balancing stuff, which is not called that anymore. It's now called work-life integration, if anybody has one that. It's not called balancing anymore. 
integration. The experts now call it work life integration. <laughs> no, it's actually, I actually like integration much better. I, I met so many people whose life is work and they love it, right? It's not that they are forced to do stuff or they want to work, they love it. And why would we go to them and say, oh no, you know, you need work-life balance, you know, don't, you're working way too hard. If that's what they feel comfortable with, let them get on with it, it's great. If, if they are happy people, right? And they might be very unhappy if you made them not work on the weekend or something. You know, and other people are, you know, want to have a more balance, balance is not even the right word, want to do stuff outside their work, and they should be allowed to do that too. Qu a question: you, you claim that for you this makes you more efficient. Yes. Does it make you? Does it make you more creative? Um, that's a good question. Uh, so thinking about stuff is a task. <laughs> so I put myself tasks, but when I need to think about something, I, I I don't know what to do yet. I put that in there, and then I take an hour and just think about something. That's fine. Um, creative. It does in the sense that it frees up my time, yeah. uh, right? Because uh, all this administrative garbage that I have to do, um, I do very efficiently. So I, I do it in an hour where other people take four um, because I, I claim I'm very efficient with that sort of stuff. I don't forget it and I do it quickly. And I do it in a sort of half hour blocks. And that makes me very efficient on that stuff that can be done efficiently. The thinking is not something, there's no efficiency in that. You either have a good idea or you don't, and you can't force them to come. You have to sit down and say, okay, now I'm thinking, okay, what am I thinking? Oh, yeah, that oh, no. Well, what I'm asking is if, if you're action based, you know, with this method, mm -hmm. you're kind of, you're more into an engineering kind of way of seeing things. And, you know, that I would say that from a certain perspective, maybe not in this framework, I'm just asking because yeah. I don't know. No, no, I know what you you're know, saying. It's, it's less flexible and I flexibility and creativity, I see them as something, you know, which go together. I would contest that it's not, uh, that it's less flexible. I think this is extremely flexible because you're reviewing, if you treat everything you write down as dogma, you're making it very inflexible. But the whole point is not to do that. So you might have written down your next action on project X is this, but as you review it tomorrow, you may say, well, that's stupid, actually. I don't, I don't think that's true. Then you delete it and you put another one in. Um, the key, the, the one thing it has made me do is realize what I can't do, right? It may, it's very obvious you have as a next action on project X and it's been there for three months and it's never ever risen to the top of your list that then it's time to write an email to the person who's waiting for it <laughs> and say I'm sorry it's not gonna happen right or to say damn this is so important I must give this higher priority I mean it's really about identifying much better what's important and so if I don't think it, it has anything has any negative side effects on creativity if you're a creative person, if you're a creative person, you will use this creatively, I think. <laughs> More creatively than, than others, perhaps. I mean, there's a lot of creativity that can come from that system. Because it is flexible, actually. Mm -hmm. it's, it's much more flexible than a calendar. Okay? Anything else? Cool. Thank you. Enjoy. Thank you.